Fantastic. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to Youth in India and China, Hope and Anxiety Amidst Global Change. My name is Laura Neitzel. I'm Senior Fellow in Global Thought and Senior Lecturer in History at Columbia University. I'm also the lead uh, researcher, along with Vishaka Desai, on the project Youth in a Changing World, which over the past five years has taken us to 16 countries and given us the honor of engaging in conversations with close to 500 young people about their hopes and anxieties about growing up in a rapidly changing world. Um, in the course of our research, we've met many, many people. We're indebted to so many people who have helped us arrange um, um, our, our research workshops in different parts of the world. And, and the people that we're indebted to include today's interlocutors, Zach Dykwald and Vivant Marwaha. Uh, we're indebted to them for their assistance on the project, but we're even more indebted to their work on young people of China and India, work that's convinced us and we think will convince you that paying attention to the aspirations, worries, opinions, and worldviews of the young people who will inherit the leadership of these two most populous nations in the world is important not only to their own leaders and their own nations, but to the entire world. So we're excited to have them both here today. And I thought it was a really um, exciting opportunity to get them to engage in conversation with one another about their research, which is actually quite similar in many ways um, to compare their notes and findings to find commonalities and uh, where their kind of conclusions also part ways. Um, but also a wonderful opportunity for them to uh, learn even more about each other's work and research. So it's my honor to introduce them. So first I'd like to introduce Zach Dykwald, uh, who actually is a, a, a graduate of Columbia College, class of 2012. Welcome back, Zach, even if virtually. Um, it's wonderful to have you back. I just learned it while we were waiting for everyone to log on that Zach was an English major at Columbia College. I'm thinking, okay, what took you to China? Well, it was the serendipity of a Chinese literature class, which um, you know ignited a love for China and Chinese and took him there and changed his life. So it's, I love hearing those kinds of stories. Um, Zach is the founder and CEO of the Young China Group that provides research and guidance on Young China for brands, businesses, investors, and governments. He's the author of Young China, How the Restless Generation Will Change Their Country and the World, published by St. Martin's Press in 2018, a book that chronicles conversations he had with young people born after 1990, uh, really his peers, <laughs> to see how they feel about everything from money and sex to their government, the West, and China's shifting role in the world. Zach, I'm so happy that you could join us today. Joining him in conversation will be Vivan Marwaha, who's a, a user research who works on technology projects in emerging markets. He's the author of a book that is hot off the press uh, called What Millennials Want, Decoding the Largest Generation in the World, just out by Penguin. It investigates millennial attitudes towards sex, marriage, employment, religion, and politics. Um, it just came out this past April, uh, August and is already in its third printing in India. So congratulations, Vivon. And uh, that's, that's amazing. Um, moderating their conversation today will be our very own Dr. Vishaka Desai, who's the chair of the Committee on Global Thought and senior advisor for global affairs to the president of Columbia University. So much of her work and career has focused on young people um, from her work in the Youth in a Changing World Project at Columbia and obviously her pedagogy in the classroom with young people. Uh, but when she was president of the Asia Society, she also developed a major interdisciplinary program for young leaders entitled Asia 21. Um, as chair of AS AFS International Program, she works with youth across the world. Vishaka also has a new, a new book, a memoir titled World is Family, A Journey of Multi-Rooted Belongings that just came out this past summer from Columbia University Press. And that actually is igniting a lot of conversation about, amongst young people who really, um, many of whom really relate to the idea of being a global, what she calls a global native. Um, in other words, a kind of living between and among cultures. So thanks to all of you for joining us today and we're very excited uh, to hear your conversation. Thank you, Laura, for that more than generous introduction. I think that, let me just say what a thrill it is for me personally to have you, Zach and Vivan in conversation. 
as we have said in the title, it's really a conversation between the two of you. And I'm just going to nudge you along. Not that you need that nudging, because I know you've known each other and you've been in conversation for some time. As I know, Vivan, you have mentioned in your book and you acknowledge Zach. And it was Zach who brought Vivan to us. So I, I really hope that it's a conversation that all of our um, attendees, and by the way, they have signed up from more than 12 countries. And the, from the names, it seems like people are coming from everywhere. And for those of you for whom nine o'clock AM time Eastern is a bit of a challenge, we apologize because there is no other way to do these global conversations. Somebody has to suffer. So I'm sorry that you have to suffer. And that's true of both of our panelists who we thought were gonna be in China and India. However, they're both on the East West Coast. So thank you for getting up so early to set this conversation. Um, let me just start by asking both of you that you, you know, for some of us of a certain age, it's like amazing that you put this book together and they're amazing books. Um, but what was the impetus for you to write the book? And we're gonna go right into it because what occurred to me was that Zach, you, as Laura mentioned, didn't know much about China, got this literature class, you go off there and next thing you know, you're writing about China and young people. Vivan, you're obviously India born, not just Indian American. We're in college here, go back to India and you start actually looking at this. So both of you have different perspectives on what you were learning. And yet it seems to me that, tell me what was your impetus for writing the book? Who did you write for? Why did you write it? So let's start with you, Vivian, first. Uh, thanks for having uh, having me and having us, Vishaka, for this important conversation. Um, to answer your question about the impetus for writing my book, um, like you mentioned, I had just you know graduated from college. Um, I was a very you know doe-eyed recent graduate in India, and I wanted to uh, you know I got my degree in the U.S. I wanted to you know have uh, some type of uh, really interesting impact um, and be on the front lines of some of the conversations that we were having in India at the time in 2017. So back then I was working at a think tank, and it was really interesting work that we were doing on all types of issues that touch the lives of you know Indians from data protection and the technology realm to uh, trade policy and geopolitics. But what I felt was that one of the most important people um, were being, uh, or groups of people were being left out of this conversation. And that was India's youth. Uh, now India has a median age of 28 and nearly 450 million people born between the ages, uh, the, the years of 1981 and 1996 who are India's millennials. And if you read some of the public conversations and the policy conversations taking place back then, the views of this generation were just not represented at all. And there was and very little- Just to remind people, Vivan, as you mentioned in your book, 450 million is the population of US and Canada combined. Exactly. That's just the young people. Exactly, so, and that's just millennials. But that perspective, you know? Exactly. And, and so back then I was like, you know, what's going on? What, what are the views of this generation? What are the aspirations? What are the anxieties? What do they want from life? And there was very little data or understanding we had back then. So I decided, you know, well, why not me? Why don't I go out and, and collect this information? And why don't I start talking to young people? And my, my main goal was essentially talking to those folks who are not traditionally spoken to by the media that's in Delhi and Mumbai, and those who are not traditionally thought of, you know, when we think about India and the future. So these are people in small towns and cities. These are people who are recently, you know, migrating from rural villages to, uh, to, to towns and cities and, and really, you know, focus on them and document their aspirations and anxieties. No, it's amazing because you yourself are part of that generation. So you're kind of talking to people who are your cohorts. As Zach, that was true for you too. And it seems to me from what Vivan was saying, that idea of the generation that's moving from one place to another. 
to in smaller places, not just Beijing and Shanghai, but Chengdu and smaller towns, towns, no cities. I mean, there's still 10 million people, so you can't really say small cities, but by Chinese standards, secondary cities. So tell us a bit about not just why you started writing, but the approach you took to writing, because that is another thing that's quite different between your two books. Sure. Well, it's, it's great to be here, uh, as Vivan said, and it does feel like a long time coming. So I, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to take part in this conversation. Uh, the reason I wrote Young China was, I think, like a lot of people, whenever they want to put something new in the world, they're they're upset with what exists. And to me, it felt like the conversation about China outside of China was obsessed with sort of two versions of it. First was big government, which is scary. Uh, <coughs> the next is a big economy, which is exciting or scary, sort of depending on that day of coverage. There wasn't much conversation about the people. And when there was conversation about people, it was one of extremes. You have sort of super rich, super poor, sort of Maserati driving for our die second, second generation rich, or sort of the dog eating festivals over in Guizhou. You had ghost cities where people, you know, grossly underpopulated, no one there, or visions of Beijing and Shanghai at rush hour where people are getting shoved onto the subways. The more time I spent in second and third tier China, the more apparent it became to me that the average, the everyday, the mundane was actually the most poorly understood aspect of China. And, and then this young element, because China has changed so fast, which of course we're gonna be getting into later, uh, stereotypes about China, understanding of China becomes outdated much faster than other places in the world. And so the, the understanding of China was based on old China, not just older people, but also older visions of, of what people want for themselves, their family, their country. And so for me, trying to put forward a, a, a version of the average of the everyday became really important, uh, particularly when you think about the consequence. I mean, partly what I think is so cool about today's conversation, we're talking about a third of the global youth population. That's countries. why I always say that it matters to the world. This is not just a conversation about two countries. It mm -hmm. is about the world because what happens there with young people will have huge impact on the whole world. Without a doubt, enormous consequence. And I think particularly from the United States, it's always tempting to think about, you know, who's going to be the second most impactful country outside of us. What I think is so interesting about today's conversation is you're talking about two generations who are the first generations in the last five, 600 years of, of global history from Asia to who are going to be having the level of global impact and consequence uh, that we'll be seeing over the next decade or two. Now, in terms of approach, I'll, I'll do this really quickly. There's basically three different pillars from, from my perspective. First was primary research. Did interviews around 15 different provinces in China, spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours on trains traversing the city, um, talking with young people and trying to get a more representative um, standing. Uh, second is secondary research, reading everything that existed and, and the vast majority, uh, or trying to read everything that existed, the vast majority of Chinese research never gets translated into English. And so bridging that information gap was a great opportunity. And third was personal anecdotes. Um, I wanted to write a book that uh, I actually had my sister in mind who well, my sister would like to read. My sister does not really care much about China, but I figured if the stories were human enough, if there was enough empathy that could be created, uh, it could draw people in who were, you know, beyond the, the with all due respect, the Columbia crowd uh, for people who would, who really need to be understanding China on a, what I think of as a, a human first perspective. Yeah, so for me, what was very interesting about that is that it was very clear that you had written it for the audience that actually doesn't know China well. Whereas Vivan, my sense of your book is that it's written as much for Indian policymakers, Indians, as it is about the rest of the world. And yet what is common between two of your books is you both feel very strongly that people, even if they talk about young people, they're not talking to young people, that actually what you need to do is to get more sense of where they're at. And that, that in that sense, you share something. And that you also went to 
many, many cities, 15 cities, 900 interviews, very much a primary research that way. But data becomes a very important part of your book. But the other thing that I think is very interesting to me about what both of you really show us is that many of us who have spent decades studying India and China, I often would say, you know, here are these two generations after 350 years, as you said, Zach, they are now going to be back center stage. And I always say, again, we have to remember that circa 1600, 50% of the world's GDP came from those two countries alone. And 2050, it is likely that that will happen again. So the point is that our expectation is that therefore young people should be very ambitious, but also optimistic. Their aspirations would be big, but they should be optimistic. And yet I want to kind of move to that idea of that the sense of anxiety and pressures that these young people feel in both countries is very palpable in both of your books. So I want to talk a little bit about their sense of self in both countries and, and the role of social media. Because partly, and Vivan, you talk about that in a very, very uh, palpable way. And Zach, in your book, it comes through again and again and again. That social media is pervasive. It's in their life. And that is changing partly what that sense of self is in relation to other generations. And how might you think about that, Zach? Well, what's... What's so interesting and why, why I really love comparing India and China versus China and the United States or China and Western Europe, uh, actually there are more corollaries with Western, Western Europe in some ways is uh, similar to India, China is historically fractured by, by language, region, um, and, and culture really from, you know, if each, if each unique language is representative of, of sort of a unique culture, uh, China like India is, is extraordinarily diverse. What's so interesting about China, uh, obviously there's, there's standard Mandarin and, and social media's role has served to, to sort of level a regional playing field. And so what people are paying attention to in Beijing for the really the first time ever uh, is similar to what people are paying attention to in Chengdu and the ability to have that level of cross-cultural um, interactivity uh, in terms of what it's doing to a national culture, it's creating one. Uh, one of the I, I lived in Chengdu for most of this, and and one of the things that became really popular the last three or four years is is rap, and and some of the best rappers were from Chongqing and Chengdu, where where they speak Sichuanese and and Chongqinghua, which is quite similar to Sichuanese, although people from Chongqing would kick me for saying that. Um, but the point is, is that that there's these there's visibility, um, and there's access, and there's an ability for I don't want to call it homogeneity, uh, but the ability for interaction across regional culture that wasn't existent before. Um, I will say social media in terms of it, people's sense of self, uh, China spends about, and young people in China spend about two times as much time on their phone as people in the United States, like a full 2x. Uh, if you look at their level of engagement on social media apps, it's actually around 3x what we have in the US. So if people are thinking about themselves or their, their cousins and, and they think they're phone junkies, um, it's light work compared to what people are putting in in, in China. Um, anxiety and pressure if I were to, to sort of identify one defining characteristic, uh, or if I were to choose three, anxiety would be top. Um, and that comes from the pressure to get ahead in the middle school market, you know, from a really young age, the high school market, the college market, the graduate school market, the job market, the marriage market, the real estate market. Uh, and because of China's inverted demography, another thing that makes it really unique, um, that pressure is far more acute. Uh, it used to be that China had a lot of young people and very few old people. In 1950, there was about five or six kids per family. So the right. bottom of that demographic pyramid and the average life expectancy was 40. Uh, right. And so the retirement system was youth. The young people would look after the old. There's been an incredible longevity revolution. And so now the average life expectancy is 75, 76. Right. And because of the one child policy, the world's biggest baby bust, uh, that sort of sturdy, stable pyramid has turned itself on its head. Well, it's like what people have said, China is one of the few countries that's getting older before it gets richer. 
The middle and income the pressure trap. exactly. That actually people feel, young people feel, is the pressure, not just of parents, but grandparents and how to deal with that. And I think that it seems to me from what you were talking about as a, a social media creating a national culture. To some extent, I wonder, Vivan, if that feels right to you as well. The one thing I will say is that I've always thought about China with a sense of a country historically goes all the way back to Shinshiwangdi. So you're talking about more than 2000 years old concept of nation and, and the central government and things of that sort. Whereas India actually didn't become a nation even under the British rule until 1947, when it got its independence. And when the languages are different, I mean, they are different. You can't understand a word of what somebody else can read. It's more like Europe in that sense. And even, even more so because Southern languages are not even like Indo-European languages of the North. So Vivan, in terms of both the anxiety, but also especially for young people in India, with the social media, you talk very poignantly about the sense of self that seems to be very important, unlike other generations. So tell us, how do you think of that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things I found when I was doing my interviews and, um, you know, like you mentioned earlier, I did more than 900 of them across, you know, North and South and East and West India, uh, is that social media has been one of the most defining um, uh, characteristics or, you know, revolutions among millennials. And why is that? So in positive, many positive and a few negative ways. Uh, but the greatest positive way that it's been revolutionary have been in creating a sense of self where none existed earlier. So after India's independence, the country, you know, adopted a socialist model of uh, economic growth. And there was very little choice available to really anyone, you know, in terms of what they wanted to purchase or even the jobs that were available to them. Then the economy slightly opened up in 1991 and you know, there was an IT revolution in India, internet companies came in and then post 2010, India has the cheapest mobile data in the world, uh, more than 700 million Indians are on smartphones and the majority of these are young people. And what are they doing on their smartphones? They're on social media. Now, when they're on social media, when they're on these smartphones, young people, young Indians define the way they present themselves to the world. Um, so when they're taking a selfie, when they're choosing the right angle, when they're uploading it to their social networks, they are in control of how they are presenting themselves to the world. Now, that truly is revolutionary for many Indians because previously, and, and actually even today in a lot of places, um, other people have told you how you could present yourself to, yourself to the world. Other people told you how to behave. Other people told you how to marry. And while that still exists in a large sense in, on social media, media that those controls are far fewer so you decide who you talk to you decide who you send a friend request to and you decide who you message so in many uh, in many ways you are having conversations that you could never have physically for example if you're a young woman in a small village or if you're a member of a marginalized caste group in a city town or village as well so social media has really created this you know sense of identity um, where, and, and a sense of self where none existed earlier. It's also given, you know, young Indians countless opportunities to, again, have these conversations where they were not able to have them earlier. But in many ways, Vishaka, it's kind of the opposite of what Zach was saying uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the Chinese experience, where um, uh, it has perhaps uh, not added to national cohesion, but has taken a little bit away from it because it's allowed people to sort of coalesce into further into, you know, these tribal identities, which they may not have been able to do earlier, uh, but they are now more, you know, it's more efficient to do so now. Now, again, this might have to do with the, you know, uh, India has not sort of had a forcible change of demographics or, you know, had state control over some of these things the way, you know, the Chinese experience um, has, you know, it's, it's happened over there. But, you know, in India, there definitely is on social media, a lot of polarization, and you're seeing a lot of divisions that existed in real life manifested even worse online. 
Yeah, so I mean, it's as people talk about the social media, it can do both tribalism and opening up to the world. And both of those exist simultaneously. And so the question that actually has come up from Varsha is that when we think about sense of self and social media, there's both the sense of tradition. So Vivan, you talk about a, even a Dalit or a woman, and you talk about the woman in Hyderabad, which is such a wonderful story about how she changes herself based on what she finds on social media. But when it comes to marriages, kids are still looking at arranged marriage. Yeah. So there is a connection to the past and tradition that comes out in other ways. Then there is also the question of, the question was about the colonial mindset in the sense of self. In India, obviously, we talk about colonial is much more not just British per se, but Western connection. So for both of you, how does that play out? Sense of the tradition that injects itself in the way young people look at themselves and the sense of the world or the Western world, historical world or colonial world. Um. Yeah, you yes, know, I haven't, um, I haven't really noticed uh, that in the interviews that I did. Um, what I found to be most uh, prevalent was uh, a sense of um, linguistic identity, a sense of regional identity, and naturally a sense of your caste identity. That sort of precedes everything. So even, if, you know, when I met young Indians in big cities, it was very much like this is, you know, where I operate in the local geography. And there wasn't, a, I mean, um, you know, the, the term colonial, you know, influence is now being very hotly debated both among the right and the left, uh, particularly, you know, in India, and I know in, in the US as well, and there's co conversations about decolonization so I never know you know sometimes where you know these uh, you know what, come what, from, yeah. Uh, yeah exactly and and sort of what context are situated in but I have not found that to be particularly you know a huge um, I have not found that to be very prevalent among the interviews that I did um, but you know Vishaka sort of you had mentioned this uh, story which I, I, I did want to share about you know some of the benefits of technology and the internet and of you know global in many ways, is that, you know, I met two people who, are, you know, whose stories are documented in my book, who basically transformed their lives through the internet and social media. One of them, you know, was a Dalit rapper who comes from a small town in a poor state called Orissa, uh, who, you know, basically he was a student at a university in Delhi and, you know, a, a, a member from the Dalit community. For those who are not familiar with this community, they have traditionally been considered untouchable in India's caste system and, you know, severely discriminated against. And so, you know, uh, th this uh, student from, from the Dalit community was just uploading rap videos. And in 2016, another, uh, there was a high profile suicide of a Dalit scholar in India and and this uh, gentleman's rap videos you know went viral on YouTube and since going viral on YouTube he's performed in Paris in Mauritius all over India and he became you know a, a voice for Dalit mobilization in India and just this past year actually he got into Oxford but he got in without a scholarship and so what did he do? He went online, he went on social media, and he crowdfunded his master's to go to Oxford. And he's at Oxford today, you know, he wasn't given a scholarship, so he raised that money online. And the second person I talk about in my book is a lady named Nazneen, who is a domestic abuse survivor in Hyderabad, who, you know, she had an abusive marriage in Qatar and she came back home to her parents. She was pregnant and she was watching these videos on YouTube all day. They were makeup tutorials. And after she delivered her baby, she's like, well, I need something to do with my time. Let me practice these makeup tutorials I was watching. And eventually from practice, she started charging, you know, girls in her neighborhood a little bit. And then from there, she moved on to bridal makeup. She started, um, uh, specializing in other services, hired other women to help her. And when I met her, was opening her own salon, you know, just simply, you know, 
based on YouTube videos she had seen and through WhatsApp and Instagram and Facebook that became her word of mouth. Now that story is so remarkable because it would, you know, it's such a millennial story. It would not have taken 20 years ago. You know, imagine either of these two individuals, um, you know, what their lives would have been like 20 years ago and what their lives are like today. And they've really been able to transform them because of the internet and because of social media, which is something really unique to our generation. Yeah, I mean, I think Sark, um, that when, when I, that's why I thought the colonial, the word colonial might not have the same level of resonance for younger people as it does outside of the countries. But there is something about the world, the West, how people perceive that, and the fact that you have a rapper, a Dalit rapper. Rap would not have happened in India were it not for happening in America with the African-American youth and communities. So there is some kind of easy connection that happens, but uh, what's your sense, Zach, of the way the young Chinese look at themselves vis-a-vis -vis the world and vis-a-vis -vis the rest of uh, the big cities and countries and where they are? One of the most defining characteristics of this young generation particularly compared to the older generations in China, is a sense of pride. Uh, and, and this is important. Uh, one of, if, you, if you read a high school history book in China, that was part of the book. I compared high school history books around the country. Um, history obviously informed our sense of self and our sense of identity within the world. Compared it with Taiwan and Hong Kong, actually, which was really interesting, but story for another day. Um, China is very clear in that it was, at its worst, only a half colony. Um, during it's sort of the lowest of the low post-opium wars. Um, and in fact, India, of course, makes, makes a lot of appearances um, sort of in opposition of that. And when you think about older populations in China, the sense of self was that the, the rest of the world was better, that China is the weak man of Asia. Um, when you think about consumption, foreign is better. Anything with an English word on it is seen as higher quality. Um, and for this younger generation, they've grown up as China has become stronger, more coordinated, better respected. Uh, again, I talk about the post 90s generation. If in 1990 you were to talk about the US and China having a trade war, uh, that wouldn't be a trade war. That would be a, you know, a hegemonic power bullying a, a secondary or tertiary power. Wouldn't be that. So the idea that people are now considering a sort of G2 meeting right. between US and China, that, that's a level of stature that didn't exist. There's a brief story that I like to tell that sort of hits home for people when you think about the shift in self-identity, and it's that of the Olympics. So I, again, I was born in 1990. Um, actually, in the last chapter of the book, uh, a gentleman who named himself Tom, it's obviously not his name, uh, from, from a city outside of Chengdu, uh, he tells a story about the first time he ever saw the United States, which was in 1996. 1996 was the Atlanta Olympics. And he talks about you know going to see he was going to watch it on a TV that was sort of rolled out into a central area around his, around his home. Uh, his house didn't have a TV. Uh, it was sort of like this black and white clunky thing. And he remembers his mom pointing at the TV and saying, look, there's America. It's the strongest country in the world. And that year, the United States won, I believe, 44 gold medals and China won around 16, uh, which is not bad in 1996 for a country whose per capita GDP was like 400, 500 bucks. Um, Fast forward to 2008, and I, I bet everyone who's attending today remembers where they were when they watched the Beijing opening ceremony. We think of it as China's coming out party, uh, you know, a country beating its chest and saying, here we are, we are, we are strong, we are coordinated, we are gliding towards the future. What I think we often neglect is that it was also China's coming out story to itself. It was its yeah. redefinition for the, for the rest of the country, particularly for, you know, folks like Tom's parents who are used to seeing China not as strong, not as coordinated, certainly not as gliding towards the future. Uh, but for this young generation in China, uh, that shift over the years was something they'd gotten used to. So in 2008, Beijing and China win, I think it was 48 gold medals, and the United States won around 36. Now, a gold medal isn't worth that much, but pride, the feeling that you can stand shoulder to shoulder uh, with the greatest country in the world, which is what you've been told since you were a child, uh, whether or not it is, of course, is up for debate. 
uh, it, it really makes this young generation unique. Um, and on this question of identity, I just want to arc back on this really quickly. When you talk about the older generations in China, the way that people talked about them was in terms of efficiencies. They were talking about how many shirts or how many units or how many phones can be put together in an hour or a week or a month. They weren't interested in the people. And so this young generation in China is the first generation who people aren't just worried about efficiencies. They're wondering who they are, what they like, what kind of soda makes them happy, what, what a good meal looks like, where they want to travel. Uh, what does masculinity and femininity look like in 2022? Uh, what turns them on? What turns them off? What keeps them up at night? These are identity questions. Yeah. And so suddenly and that the entire the world made. yeah, is interested, yeah. not just in what can China make, but who right. China is, who these young people right. are. That's a, a, a seismic tectonic shift right. uh, in the space of one generation. And that's what's so amazing about China is that how quickly things change. Because I remember Hu Jintao coming to the Asian Society when people were starting to talk about G2. And he said, no, 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 we're not ready yet. You can't compare that. And look where we are today. You know, it's a whole different story. There is a huge question, Vivan, for you, and that always comes up. And that is that how can we ever generalize about India with so much diversity, so many different lenses, different people in different parts? And how do we square that idea of how the Indian millennials behave versus a very specific context, whether it's caste, whether it's gender, whether it's the cities and the places where they come from? And so any, any thoughts on that? I'm sure that question has come up for you all the time when you have discussed the book. Yeah, I, I read that question as well. Um, you know, there's this very popular adage about India that you can say one thing and it'll be true, and you can say the exact opposite, and that will also be true. Uh, now, about the question, which is, you know, primarily focused on gender and women's access to mobiles. So now my book relies on basically two principal sources of data uh, to, that provide its structure. So the first, uh, the more than 900 interviews that I did myself, which to answer the question were done in person. So they were not done over a mobile phone. And, and so I really got to meet an interesting cross section of society while I was doing those interviews. Um, now they were uh, more, there were more men in my sample than women. And that's because as a young man doing research in small town India, it is naturally, you know, the, the young women are naturally reticent to speak to someone from my, you know, profile. So there were more young men who I spoke to, but not out of choice, but out of constraints. But the second source of data I use uh, is a data set collected by uh, India's preeminent, you know, think tank that does opinion polling and election polling called the Center for the Study of Developing Societies. And they do a youth survey every 10 years, and they have more than 6,500 respondents, almost equally distributed uh, between genders, regions, caste groups, and socioeconomic groups in India. And so everything in my book, Vishaka, like you mentioned, it is very fact heavy, because I make it, you know, I painstakingly make it clear that I'm not talking, you know, about about the 900 people I met who still might not be representative of millennials or I'm not talking about you know people I hang out with but I'm talking about an entire generation and like we discussed earlier the choices and views of this generation in many ways uh, have an impact beyond India you know you're seeing the way um, there's a lot of conversations happening in the U.S. right now about companies being very vocal in the United States but then staying absolutely silent on issues that you know of, uh, that are taking place in China and I have a feeling in five ten years as those companies are trying to get more active in India and as they want more Indian users you know how might they behave with respect to millennials and younger people over there so my book has you know some of these answers and I I, I don't make any predictions but uh, I, I do talk about you know how the choices and views of this generation could impact the world as a whole um, there was also another you know if you'd allow me to address the, the other question as well about, which I think is a really interesting one, um, uh, whether young Indians still have the aspirations to move abroad. And, you know, I was just uh, before coming back to the US, I was in Punjab in India, in a town called Amritsar. 
Amritsar. I was doing an event there. And when you go around Amritsar, one of the most common signs, one of the most common businesses you see are immigration centers. And these are immigration centers largely to Canada. Uh, you know, there's direct flights between Amritsar and Toronto. Um, and Amritsar is not that big of a city for the, it to have so many direct flights with, you know, Western countries. Uh, but, you know, wherever you go, there's coaching centers for uh, the IELTS, which is an English language test. There's coach coaching centers for the TOEFL. And then there's immigration offices for to help people get to Canada, Australia, and the U.S. And why is that? Punjab is a fairly wealthy state in India. Incomes are quite high. But there's no opportunity. Opportunity. There's no formal jobs available for people. So, for, so uh, young people feel that if they want to have a life for themselves, and if they also want some freedom from their families, they have to ultimately move out of the country. And you're seeing that, you know, take place all over India. So South India also has this. There's many universities actually in the US that are universities in name only, but are essentially visa factories that allow, you know, people from India to come in and work in the the US uh, and on paper they're students but they're actually working for software companies over here and these people pay a considerable fee to these universities to do so and I spoke to some of these young Indians and they felt like you know we do not actually have a chance to build a better life for, life for ourselves over here and the only way we'll be able to do it is by moving out of the country and so that is definitely something that's still taking place and is also increasing right now in India. Yeah, I mean, I think that that whole idea of democratic dividend that everybody was talking about for India, that actually does mean that when you need to have, what, 10 to 20 million jobs per month, and when you don't have that, where are you going to go? And I think that, Zach, um, that idea of there are so many, I mean, right now, Chinese are the number one uh, foreign students in American universities. So clearly, Chinese are going abroad as well. But I'm going to move that conversation aside a little bit. And I wanna just quickly move to idea of sex and marriage. How are they, and provide very brief answer in terms of what their attitudes are compared to their parents and where they come out. And then I wanna to move to economics and a little bit about the politics because our time is gonna run out soon. Sex and marriage. So uh, it used to be that premarital sex was considered akin to sin in sort of Mao's China. Um, now it's not. Uh, so yeah. in 1987, I believe the statistic is from, um, I think only 15% of people were having premarital sex. Now only 15% aren't having premarital sex. Uh, so it's sort of like a light switch on and, on and off. Uh, I got to speak with one of China's, China's foremost sexologists about this. And I think when we imagine sort of this sort of sexual revolution, which is it's tempting to call it, uh, we sort of imagine our version of it, which was, you know, the 70s and, and Woodstock and, you know, wherever your mind goes with that, it's probably the case. Uh, she makes she makes a comment. Uh, Professor Lee makes a comment that in China, it's a very it's an extremely quiet sexual revolution, which is there is an earnestness towards sex where, where people want to have it, but they want to have it with a, a serious partner for the, for the most part. Um, and instead of having it sort of with everyone, they want to have it with someone and they want to have it earlier instead of later. Uh, the chapter, I think, is called Sex for Fun, uh, the idea that, that it could be sort of a, a, for enjoyment. And there was actually a rollout in the 90s and early 2000s with, from the Chinese government sort of trying to recondition uh, attitudes towards sex from that place of sin to one of uh, potential enjoyment. Now they're kind of stepping that back as they're worried the, uh, uh, there's a little too much enjoyment going on um, amongst young people. Uh, Vivan, one thoughts on that and compared to the parents, especially. Yeah, it's a little bit different uh, from what Zach mentioned in China. You know, in arranged marriage and 84% of married millennials have had arranged marriages in India. And for many of those uh, individuals, the first time they're having sex is actually after marriage. And why is that? You know, many young Indians still live at home with their parents across socioeconomic brackets. Now, when you're living at home with your parents, it's very difficult to sort of sneak a boy or a girl in and, you know, engage in that. But after you get married, you sort of, you know, obviously you're encouraged to do so. And then the, and everyone will pry about when you're having 
uh, a child. So it's uh, it's naturally encouraged. Um, but you know what's interesting is that um, because you know young Indians don't actually have an opportunity to to have premarital sex uh, in ways that their counterparts in other countries are able to. They're consuming a lot of pornography online, particularly mm-hmm. young men, and this is becoming a little bit of a, a of a problem in India, even though it's officially banned. You know, I think the government have banned more than a hundred pornography websites. There's still a lot of proliferation of this content, and naturally, you see, you know, crimes against women as well. I mean, obviously, not in a very high. I mean, I, 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 it's it's not a huge epidemic, but it is a problem that you know that that's happening, and then you're also seeing conversations around marital rape, which is not illegalized in India, and 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 those taking place as well. Well, I think that the point, one of the things that you both talk about in the book is that both in India and China, actually the uh, the rate of women to men is a huge issue. There are many more men than there are women, partly because of one child policy and attitude towards sons in India, also having actually early abortions with ultrasounds. And so in both cases, you have these young people and there are not enough women. And I think part, some people have suggested that the kind of crime against women in India partly has to do with not having enough spaces, not that you justify it, but that it does create a very kind of lopsided situation when it comes to this. So, and the last question I have about this is the parents. I love, Zach, your chapter on eating your parents, which is kind of the pressure on the kids. And uh, you, uh, Vivan, have talked about the kind of continuity that people have with the very strong family bond. So just a few words about that idea towards family and parents. Zach? So, so China doesn't have religion traditionally, at least not in a, a Western sense, uh, but it does have family. And a lot of the moral systems, sort of Confucianism, Neo-Confucianism, the, the version that it's become today, uh, centers around relationships between family. Um, and so to be a good person is often to be a good child. Uh, the idea of Shun, filial piety, uh, which is a bad translation because I would never you know, say, hey, Vivan, I'm gonna go home and be filially pious to my mom or dad, it just doesn't really roll off the tongue. Even if they hope that you would. They, so I'm doing my best, uh, but it's not, it's not conversational. In China, it's, it's equated with, with just goodness, capital G. Um, and so in the past, that was easy, you know, back to that demographic pyramid. A lot of young people, very few old people, it was easy to look after your parents when you had a bunch of siblings and life was short. Now, as that demographic pyramid inverts, and if you could also imagine this like a funnel, you know, they call it the four, two, one crisis, four grandparents, two parents, one child. It's a funnel for attention, a funnel for love, a funnel for food. It's part of why there's an obesity issue in China right now. In a show, not tell culture, food is a great way to express love from, from grandparents to children. Um, it means intergenerational households, which is exciting, but it also means a funnel down for pressure. And um, the pressure these young people feel who, again, to be a good child, to be a good person, who, who really want to be looking after and being attentive and doting to their parents, but are economically and financially completely unable to do it. Uh, and so you have these young people who are eating their parents, which means relying on them financially to a much later date in life than, than they want or anticipate uh, in order to try to respond to some of those pressures about having a house or having an apartment, being able to build a family uh, in order to please their parents. So in order to please them, they're, they're quote unquote eating them financially and it creates a, a really large moral uh, push, pull, tug of right. war internally for this young generation. Yeah, I mean, I think that one thing that you both bring up in a beautiful way is that while the changes have been dramatic, especially in China, but even in India, that it also creates complications because some of the traditional attitudes don't go away so quickly and they keep pushing into the new ways of being. So one last question around this, uh, that's about jobs. And both of you have talked a lot about the anxiety around jobs. Um, And Vivan, you talk a bit about how entrepreneurship becomes one model, but the truth is there's simply not enough job created in India, formal or informal. 
and at the same time, aspirations are high. So how do we think about where this whole idea of economy and jobs are going to end up for young people? Yeah, you know, I think this I'll is- I'll ask you to the... be brief because I want yeah. to get to one more question, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I, as I can. This is one of those really interesting points of divergence between India and China. And that's because, you know, in India, even though the economy liberalized in 1991, we never had a manufacturing revolution. So we have a, a very big agricultural economy, which still employs almost 70% of the country's workforce, a tiny manufacturing sector, and then a big services economy on top of that. Now that services economy is financial services, IT, but also, you know, hospitality and things like that, which actually, they, it creates a lot of revenue but does not employ a lot of people so to a young person today what type of job really is available to you a job for life that will give you stability and a good income it's a government job and so the number one choice of job for for young indians today uh, is is a government is a career in the government 65 percent of young indians say that a government job is the number one priority in life and when i say a government job i'm not talking about being a diplomat or being a you know a, a cool you know officer doing ha having an impact but li quite literally being a messenger at a government office making about 100 150 dollars a month you know fetching tea for superiors and filing papers and cabinets and running errands. Uh, in the state of Uttar Pradesh, two years ago, 19 million people applied for 63,000 jobs in the country's railways. Just this last month, there were job riots in India that took place when positions in the railways opened up. And again, these are not high paying or prestigious positions. They're just positions that you know give Indian stability and basically a job for life and then a pension after that. And they're so coveted because private, the private sector has just not been number one, big enough, and number two, stable enough to provide those types of jobs that young Indians need to start their own families, to buy their own homes, and then to retire with some type of dignity and grace. Um, and so that's really been a huge, you know, you cannot look at employment and jobs in India without looking at the aspirations for a, a government job. This, this to me is stunning, and there's a great crossover with China. So I, I'm a fan of Yvonne's work, and we've been talking for years now just because there are such interesting corollaries. Um, right. It reminds me of China in the early 2000s, which right. is when a government job, it's stability. It's, uh, you know, they, call it, they called it the iron rice bowl. It wouldn't get you rich, but it would never break. Uh, right. in, the early, in the late 2000s, it was the golden rice bowl because people were profiting so much from corruption. Uh, and then, of course, in late 2012, that rice bowl kind of broke uh, with the anti-corruption campaign. But this reliance on, on government jobs, when, when I was reading Vivan's work, it felt like young people in India were often on the back foot, thinking about stability, thinking about uh, being able to be independent, be, getting sort of the basics down. Uh, versus um, in China, there is a sense that those basics in certain communities, and I don't want to say everyone, there's a big wealth gap in China and there's, there's in third tier and below cities, it's a much different scenario, but the, the want to be entrepreneurial, the feeling that you can, you're not just looking for stability, you're looking for something beyond that. Uh, it feels to me a palpable uh, divergence and between you and It's also a question of timing too. <clears throat> but I, I do think though that in India also, there would be a divergence between smaller cities and bigger cities. And um, bigger cities, upper middle class families would have a very different scenario where at least my sense is that the entrepreneurial entrepreneurship is much more desired because people don't think that there's any other way. But part of it is the aspiration that both Indian young people and Chinese young people have aspirations to get somewhere faster than what is possible currently. And China is much farther along in that journey, but there is the aspiration that doesn't match the reality. Is that fair, Vivan, in terms of where India is? Um, I would not necessarily say that. The aspiration in India is just to have some type of stability. Um, and and the, again, the desire for government jobs, it's one of the things that, again, unites uh, all types of Indians and it cuts across most, and, and, uh, uh, right up till you reach the top one or 2%, it cuts across most socioeconomic uh, uh, divides that otherwise, you know, 
pulled Indians apart. Um, because the aspiration right now, you know, there's just so much volatility and instability and this feeling of fighting from the back foot. The government job is the only thing that sort of allows you to have some type of stability in an unstable world. So I, I would say like the aspiration right now, you know, a, a lot of the, the founders of India's big unicorns today, the big tech companies, they have also, you know, if you read that some of their stories, they said, oh, I was actually studying for a government job right before this. Um, <laughs> and I didn't make it. And so this is why I'm doing this now. And so I do hope that, you know, that trickle down effect creates many more entrepreneurs and a culture for entrepreneurship. But I would not say it's very widespread, actually, right now, the media over represents it, but it does not actually exist on the ground. Okay. All right. What I'm going to do now is to borrowing from Zach's technique of word association, because we have very little time and I want to get to some other questions. So I'm going to give you a word and each one of you will only give me another word that associates with that as Zach, you know, already. So the first word is government, Zach. Reliable. Ivan. Um, democracy. Uh, China, Vivan. Uh, neighbor. Pride. India, Zach. Mm, little brother. Um, let's see. Love. Wants or aspirational. Vivan. Uh, unaffordable. Children. Vivan. A necessity. Expensive. Zach? Parents. Zach. Appreciation slash burdensome. That's two words. Okay. I'm That's cheating. all right. <laughs> you want? Um, anxiety. And, and if you read my book, or you, you can ask me data why. Anxiety. It's okay. Um, marriage. Zach. Pressure. Ivan. Um, arranged. Future. Ivan. Um, op optimistic. Zach. Cheating again. Tentatively aspirational. United States, Zach. Overbearing. Vivan. Opportunity. The world, Vivan. Mm. And an interesting place, three words, so yeah. <laughs> Zach. I was going to say our oyster, but uh, I don't know that that, <laughs> I don't know that that, uh, yeah, I would say opportunity there as well. Okay, that's interesting. All right, well, terrific. We've almost come to the end of our time. And what I'd love to do is to just have each one of you say in one sentence, the biggest insight that you got by writing the book and what you hope people would get from your book, Zach. For China, modernization, and this young generation, for China and this young generation, modernization does not mean Westernization. Uh, for, me, for me, it was um, a, a little bit different. It was sort of uh, understanding how different um, life is for, for you know, young Indians and how differently it's portrayed in the media and how differently it's portrayed by those who, um, you know, are trying to represent the young Indians and that, you know, the best sort of evidence is, is that, you know, when, when you ask questions yourself, because something you might read online might not necessarily be true. Okay. Terrific. Is there sure. anything that you want to say? Yeah, exactly. There's there one thing I want to say, and I want to, I want to thank you. It, um, 
you are sort of the dean of this sort of work. And we, and both Vivan and I are, are very much following in, in the path that you paved. So thank you so much for taking the time uh, to do this today, but also for architecting your life the way that you did. Uh, it, it, absolute inspiration. And there's my, one of my favorite uh, Chinese idioms is uh, fu. it translates to uh, amateur woodworkers showing off in front of a master craftsman. And today, Vivan and I are very much the amateur woodworkers, uh, but thrilled to be able to share ideas with, with this community today. My God, you have taken the Chinese attitude you may not be a filial son, but you are definitely <laughs> showing oh, that gosh. I don't believe you, but thank you for saying that. I mean, the truth of the matter is that I feel as I talk with all of you and our students in the CGT program, Youth in a Changing World, I learned so much from talking to you, partly because it is your generation that's living simultaneously in local, national and global worlds. So the anxieties of simultaneity is something you face that all of us had the luxury of not having by adding layers. And so I really feel like I learned something new every day when I talk with all of you. So thank you so much. And all of you, the audience, uh, please do buy these books. I think you would really find it both interesting, insightful, illuminating, and um, fun. So enjoy. Thank you so much for joining us. The conversation is recorded. Tell your friends, listen to it because they'll get a lot out of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks Yvonne. Thanks Vishaka. Thank, Thank you. you, Laura. Thank you to Thank Columbia. You. Board. Wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Just amazing. Are we uh, stopped recording?